Uh, so this talk is about using Burp Suite, uh, specifically around um, using plugins that are available to increase your efficiency during testing. And we'll also get into a little bit of do-it-yourself. Uh, so we'll, write, uh, we'll go walk through a, a plugin written in Python. So the real quick obligatory about me slide. Uh, my name is Brad Beltman. I work for SecureWorks. I'm an application pen tester, so I use Burp Suite every day uh, when working. Um, first time my family actually came and uh, to see one of the talks. So we got some gaps in what Burp does for us. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love it. It's awesome. It's my favorite tool to use when I'm testing. Um, there's a few gaps that we're going to fill in using plugins. We're going to talk about beefing up the scanner. We're going to talk about adding some passive detection things that you can do. Uh, we're going to look at a few specific tasks using some plugins. And then we're going to get into a little bit of writing your own. So I'm going to start out just walking through some of the basics. I'm sure that a lot of you probably use Burp and are familiar with it. Some of you probably not. Uh, so we're just going to walk through a couple of the basics real quick. Uh, first off, when you're using plugins, Make sure you understand what they are. I see a lot of people like, hey, I read this description. It sounds really cool. It's the new thing that just came out or whatever, because um, there's you know, a decent amount of plugins that, are, that come out for this now. Um, you want to understand what they're doing. Uh, they're on GitHub, so you can actually go and look and, and read a little bit of code um, and see what they're doing. At least the, the store apps are on GitHub anyway. And again, if you're not familiar with Burp, it's got an extender. It's got a store. So there's a look at what the store looks like. I hope you can kind of see that in the back. But it's got a list of plugins, descriptions, author names. Uh, there's a, a link to where it is. All you got to do is just select it, install it. Uh, as long as everything goes well, it'll install, and you can start using the plugin uh, immediately. So I mentioned some of some of Burp's gaps. The big one that that we're going to talk about is having full visibility into the all the requests and responses in all the different tools. So like the proxy history and intruder and repeater, it's not really a big deal because you can see all those, right? But things like the scanner, spider, uh, if you're running macros and something starts breaking, uh, especially in scanner, it's difficult to troubleshoot when you're not 100% sure what it's actually sending to the application. So that's the big one we're going to talk about. Uh, it also doesn't give you an easy way outside of plugins to really add any scanner checks. So we're going to look at adding scanner checks um, for you. So we're going to talk about those passive checks, just really easy, simple ways to add those in. And then we're going to look at some decoders and file format viewers. So first off, I put this one first because it's by far my favorite plugin. It's awesome for, uh, like I mentioned, troubleshooting macros, things like that. Uh, it's called Logger++. Uh, it's from NCC Group. Uh, here's a real quick look at uh, part of the configuration of it. Um, but what I, what I wanted to call it here was you can check the different tools that you want to be able to see. Um, so you don't necessarily need to run it against all tools, but um, you know, I, I really like it for scanner and every now and then sequencer and things like that because you can go back through and look. It has a whole lot of different um, things you can do with it too, like searching and highlighting and um, exporting and regexes and things like that. So here's kind of what it looks like when you're, when you're actually running something. You just have its really basic interface of, on the left you can see you know, the number of the requests coming by, which tool it's in, um, what you're scanning against, and you can see method, path, all that stuff. So it's really nice. I also like to use it to keep an eye on things. So as I'm running uh, anything automated, so I'll run automated tools like Nikto and, and things like that through Burp as well. And it's really nice. As you're, you're watching it, you'll see the request scroll through. And it's kind of nice to keep an eye on things uh, because you can spot a lot of differences in responses. So you know, as it's checking things, throwing a lot of things at the application, application obviously will respond in different ways. Um, sometimes there's, you can spot kind of interesting behavior that the tool doesn't necessarily tell you about. Uh, but it's just something you can see in the, in the results. So here's an example. So you can see. The response length there is the same throughout, and all of a sudden, one of them is a little bit different. So 
not saying that that's you know some sort of a vulnerability or some kind of finding or anything, but that's definitely something that's interesting that the application did, and I'd really like to see you know what that difference was and, and take a look and see why that was different. All the others are the same, and all of a sudden one is different. So the pros and cons of it, the, the biggest, the additional insight, um, it's really nice for troubleshooting, searching, all those things. Uh, the cons, it doesn't save automatically. So Burp now will save uh, projects and things automatically. This doesn't save any of that stuff. So if you want to keep findings that you have out of Logger++, you can export them to CSV and you can do an auto save to CSV, um, but it's kind of a pain. And the other thing is, you only see the entries in the logger after there's a response or a timeout. So if you send something and it's sitting there, you know, the application's not responding or anything, you have to sit there and wait for a timeout or if it'll eventually send it back a response. You can't see the request that was sent um, because it, it pairs them together and then pushes them into the interface. So I want to talk about beefing up the scanner a little bit. There's a lot of really good plugins that are really easy to uh, install and, and do a lot of really useful things for you. Now I like to use the scanner piece as a second set of eyes. Um, so you know, as you're going through and doing a lot of manual testing, um, scanner's really nice to find easier automatable things like you know, cross-site scripting and, and things like that. So it's a really nice second set of eyes on things. Uh, but there's a lot that we can add to it. And like I said, low-hanging fruit and tedious stuff, I, you know, I want, I want automated every time. Uh, and the main goal, obviously, being you want to focus on the application logic because uh, that's really where, you know, you add your value is, is testing out logic and things like that, not necessarily looking for cross-site scripting and, and things. So the first one is called ActiveScan++. It's written by one of the one of the people that is, uh, works for Port Swigger, which is uh, who puts out Burp, uh, and adds a lot of really useful additional scan attacks uh, like uh, XXE and other XML attacks. Um, I'm, I don't know if you guys have seen, but the new OWASP top 10 actually lists XXE as one of them. Now, I personally don't agree with that being in the top 10, and regardless of your feelings, you know, that's, that's been a little bit of an interesting subject. But that's one thing that you can automate is, is checks for that. Uh, suspicious input transforms, and we'll actually look at a few of those. Um, there's several other tools that do something similar. Uh, and then the older stuff too, so like shell shock and things that you know, aren't really necessarily out there a lot anymore, but something you still need to look for because every now and then you know, you'll see something like that. So there's no GUI component to it. All it does is just add, adds checks into the scanner, so it'll queue them up as, it, as you're scanning. Uh, some additional things, host header attacks, um, the, the input transformation, uh, so things like uh, seeing if that gets evaluated, so seven times seven, you know, things like that, and we'll look at an example. Uh, so this is uh, from a, a recent engagement that I was on where it actually fingerprinted, I don't know how well you can see it, but down over here in bold, uh, it's saying, hey, I, I found something that looks like server-side template injection. And it actually fingerprinted out to be velocity, which is an Apache product. And the way it did it is, you can see the payload here that, it, that it's using where it's saying um, hashtag set. So that's syntax and velocity to actually set that. And using that, getting a response where that was actually evaluated, it said, hey, I think this is velocity. It turned out to be right. Um, and that was actually a really interesting um, attack, if you saw uh, the talk that Jared McLeod and I did at Secure Iowa, um, we actually walked through part of that where this turned out to be a uh, shellable situation through the application. So another one, uh, additional scanner checks. So adding DOM-based uh, cross-site scripting and things like that. Now you want to be a little bit leery of that. You'll get a ton of hits on that. Uh, most of them are not exploitable. I've seen you know, engagements where I'll have 5,000 findings of DOM-based cross-site scripting. You know, it, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit verbose in that. It's erring on the side of caution. You'll get a lot, lot of false positives. Um, it does things like really simple checks like missing security headers, um, like uh, you know, um, CSP policy and things like that. 
Also looks for uh, HTTP to HTTPS redirection. And another one is J2EE scan. So this does an, another one where it's a lot of past CVEs. A lot of the stuff you don't necessarily want to be spending time manually looking for, that it will do for you. And you can see a lot of different examples there. So Java-based stuff like struts and grails, um, JBoss, that sort of thing. And a ton of other things too. Uh, once again, this one doesn't have a GUI component. Uh, it's just adding on to the scan. So this is again, this is an another recent engagement where this caught something. Uh, I did definitely did not go into this engagement saying, hey, I'm gonna find this OGNL console. Um, it was just not even on my radar as something to look for in that application, but there it was. So that console lets you evaluate um, expression language um, statements, and uh, that ended up being a, a very fruitful one as well. So the pros, it's really easy to add a lot of automated um, testing into the, the scanner. Um, there's one that does have a GUI tab, most not. I put that as a pro because as you start adding some of these some plugins and things. For those of you who use Burp, you see a lot of tabs there at the top and it's, it becomes a pain to try to find which one you're using and stuff. So I don't necessarily like to see the tabs. I mean, obviously they're useful for a lot of cases, but uh, I'd prefer to not see them in some of those. The con, the only con really being that it's gonna add time to your scan, obviously. I mean, you're adding to it, so of course. This is a, a somewhat more recent, I mean, it's been out for a little while. It's a very interesting one called Backslash Powered Scanner. Um, James Kettle, again, uh, one of the port switcher guys. Uh, doesn't necessarily look for, you know, attack string here, measure the response, see what it is. It's looking more for, hey, I'm gonna throw something kind of interesting, like I'm gonna throw in different keywords or I'm going to escape different special characters and things and see the differences. Uh, so that's the, the suspicious input transformations. Um, it's just, you know, Really, really simple example is it's going to use a backslash to escape, you know, a double quote. And then it'll run the, the same thing just without escaping it and see the differences in the application. The theory being if it, if it reacts differently to a non-escaped character than it does to an escaped character, that's obviously something that's being processed by the application, maybe something important to the application, um, and is something that is, is worth looking into. So he did a really, really good white paper on the whole theory of it and, and how he was able to optimize it and everything else. So it's, a, it's an easy one to find if you wanna go out there and just search for the white paper on uh, backslash powered scanner. Uh, so it's, like I said, it shows you the interesting results to point you towards a potential issue. So this is really one of those things that it's pointing to, hey, I saw something that is kinda odd. I don't know what it is, but you need to go check it. So it always requires manual verification. So here's an example. So I mentioned keywords. In this case, it took one of the parameters, and it's using null, and then it changed it to nzll. So it's just one letter difference. Uh, but the null keyword changed the application response. So you can see content length is much different. So obviously null is something important to the application. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's vulnerable to anything but it's definitely an interesting little bit of behavior that you wanna go check out. And sometimes it does lead to something. So this has a, a, it'll add a little menu into Burp, and this is defaults. I've never really had any reason to mess with the defaults. It, it works well for me. So pros and cons again. Con being, some of the results you'll see, it's not always very useful. Um, you'll see things that, you know, you'll see a different res response and things like that, and you'll go and look and be like, well, yeah, okay, obviously that's gonna have a different response. Um, I don't know why it's reporting that. It happens, it's not so bad. Um, again, easy additional automated tests that you can throw in um, and look for different things that you may not have thought to look for. And it's the, the really powerful thing about it is that third one there is sometimes it'll find things that other techniques will miss. So the next one is scan manual insertion point. So this is just a really, really simple one. You can add it in and it just adds a little option for you in one of the menus. Uh, so as you're looking at, say, a uh, request in any one of the tools, it could be the proxy or a repeater or whatever, you can just highlight it, right click and say, uh, scan this. 
So here's an example. Uh, you can see here where I, I've highlighted the big string there in the post body. Right? And then I just right click and do scan manual insertion point, which is really nice. I know a lot of people talk about you know, sending something to intruder and then do um, scanning that way. This saves a step as long as it's only a, a single um, parameter that you want to send to the scanner. So it's simple to use, saves you the steps. Uh, the only downside, you can only do one selection at a time and remembering it's there. I've had a lot of times where I go through and, and send an intruder or whatever and get it into the scanner just to remember like, oh, I could have just right clicked and said go. All right, so let's talk about something other than the scanner. So PDFs is something that I've personally come across in a ton of assessments, right? Um, and you'll see something like this where it's, you know it's a PDF. I mean, it's really obviously a PDF, right? But you don't necessarily know what the PDF is just by glancing at that, at the text there. So what we want to do is go from this. Um, so it's just to look at the raw request there to that. So it, what it will do is it will add this little extra tab here of PDF. So you can just switch over and it will just render it for you. So whereas the slide before, I know it's a PDF. I don't necessarily know what it is. I can look at that really quickly and say, oh, I know exactly what that is. Um, so maybe you have sensitive information or whatever, you know, whatever you happen to be looking for in the assessment. So really similar EXIF tool scanner, uh, which is really nice. So it'll scan any of the supported file formats and look for metadata for you. So looking at that same PDF, uh, we just used in the previous example, um, another tab for metadata, you can go over and see, hey, author, all this stuff. Um, you know, you, you can look for things like that using FOCA. The advantage here is if I'm doing an assessment where I am authenticated, I can now look at, you know, across metadata things really quickly um, in an authenticated state where things like search engines and FOCA and uh, search diggity and some of those other tools, you're not going to be able to find this, obviously, because it's uh, in the authenticated portion of the application. So the nice thing about it is you don't have to go through and look through the metadata of all the files. If it finds anything, it'll just throw up an issue for you and say, hey, I found metadata in PDF. And you can just go click on that. It'll list. If, you've, if you looked at, you know, 1,000 PDFs and they all had metadata, it'll list them all out for you. Uh, you can go through and, and look at them there. And it'll auto detect. So if, if you already have XF tool in your path, it'll find that for you uh, and just use that. And if not, it'll extract to a temp file and use it that way. So um, you can literally just install it and go. You don't have to worry about setting a path or anything like that. Uh, and it has this little, this little tab here. Uh, so you can, by default, it'll ignore HTML, JSON, things like that that are not going to have metadata that's going to collect. Um, so. It doesn't mess with looking through those and, and you know, giving you a performance hit essentially. And then you can turn off things too, like ignore, you know, XF tool version, things like that that you don't necessarily want to see in each one of those. So the pros and cons of those, I mean, I don't, there's no real cons that I can think of in using those. Uh, I do like to easily look at PDFs when I come across them and see what they are. Um, quick insight into the metadata uh, and, and searching all that automatically and then giving you the heads up of, hey, I found some metadata. Here's a list of everything I found. Really, really nice. So move on to passive detection. So the first one that I like to use for this is called retire.js. So this is looking at JavaScript dependencies for you and comparing them against a database and saying, hey, w I just passively saw as you were loading this page, it was using this bit of jQuery, and it's an old version, and it's vulnerable, and it's vulnerable to these known things. So it'll give you the version it saw. It'll give you links to um, CVEs and things like that, um, which is, is awesome for you know finding that stuff for you. You don't necessarily want to be looking through all the JS files of everything you get. Cause there's a lot of JS heavy applications out there now. So there's an example. So in this one, 
I found jQuery. It's a super old version of jQuery, 1.4.2. And again, I didn't have to go out there and look for that. It found it for me as I was just mapping the application. Popped it out here, and hey, it's known vulnerable to these things. So you know, jQuery a lot of times known vulnerable to cross-site scripting, things like that. Um, but it will tell you exactly uh, exactly the issues that are known. So next one is Software Vulnerability Scanner. So this is uh, by a group called Vulners. They have a, uh, a website with an API. So this plugin uses that API, and again, it's just passively watching versions of things that it's, that it's viewing as, as you're just mapping the application or, or whatever you're doing. And it'll go through user API and say, hey, I found this version of Apache or IS or whatever, and ping the API and then come back and say, hey, that particular version of this, it, it, again, is known vulnerable to, to these sorts of things. So the, the one downside is, you know, especially when you're dealing with someone like IIS, uh, it'll report a whole bunch of, you know, known CVEs for IIS 7.5 or whatever. Your, your target may very well be patched against those things. Um, you know, so it's, it's really up to you at that point to determine whether or not they're in a patch state or not. But, um, but it's really nice for, uh, for quickly finding those things. So here's an example. In this case, it found IIS 7. And then you can see, you know, list of CVEs, things like that. Uh, in this case, you know, a lot of old CVEs. It was an old version of IIS. And again, and, you know, it's, it's, it's nice because as you're going through, obviously, you're going to probably fingerprint it and you might even see in the headers of the response that, hey, it's IIS 7. You know, easy to find. Um, but this gives you a nice list then and, and says, hey, here's everything known vulnerable to, and you can go through and, and uh, look for things interesting that aren't, aren't like, uh, you know, denial of service and things that you might want to try in the engagement. Uh, obviously, yeah, go ahead. There are some not so common applications. Um, I don't have a screenshot of it, but it, it has a tab of uh, a lot of different technologies and things that it will check for. Um, so yeah, IIS, Apache, things like that are obviously in there, but some of the lesser known things, um, even some s obscure CMS systems and things like that will be in there. So the one, one thing about it is you, just get, you have to remember that it's passive. It's not actively fingerprinting anything for you. It's seen versions come across um, in the headers or in, you know, in a file or whatever and reporting that for you. Um, it's not actively doing anything to find these for you. Uh, and so there's, a, there's just a quick example there. Um, it'll put a, an issue in on, on the target tab just like some of the others, and say, here's everything I found. Uh, so as you go through, you know, you may find other versions of software that didn't detect, um, but at least you know what it did and did not find for you. All right, so another one is error message checks. So I like this one. Uh, it, it uses regex to check for verbose error messages and things like that. And it'll also create an entry just like, uh, just like the last one you saw of saying, hey, I saw uh, this matched, this regex matched on this request, and you can go through and look and see if it, you know, what the error message was. Uh, so there's, there's an example. Um, it's nice that it actually gives you the, the regexes that it matches on. And you will get some false positives because you'll have, you know, error handling and things like that in JavaScript files that sometimes will trigger on this. It's not a verbose error message that's revealing anything to you, you know, in some of those cases. Um, so you do get some false positives. But I like it because it's checking for verbose error messages in some of the tools you're running, like um, um, the scanner, you know, is, is one. Um, even, even the spider, sometimes I've had that come across something that's spitting out a, a verbose error message. So um, things that you may or may not have spotted otherwise. And so there's, uh, there's a look at the configuration for it. These are all built in, and you can put in regex matches, you know, whatever, whatever regex you want, um, and, and create those if you want. It also lets you uh, turn it on and off for different tools. So by default, these are the tools that it's looking at.
So pros, I like to I like to turn it on in, in most everything, just passively checking, so it's not you know a, a big massive resource hit or anything like that. Easy way to find those then just go under target issues. Here's a list. Um, easy to miss you know verbose error messages and some of those are really easy to spot. And then con being the false positive I mentioned that you sometimes will see in some of the JavaScript files. All right, so I want to just go to a couple of specific tasks um, using some plugins. So this is one of my favorite favorites here. It's called Autorize. Uh, and what it is is you can make identical requests under different users. Um, so you can have user one, user two, so two different users making the same request. So if I'm browsing as user one and user two can get to some of the same resources um, that live under user one's profile, I may have you know, a horizontal um, privilege escalation there. Or you can also set it up so I'm browsing as an admin and it will make requests as an unprivileged user and an anonymous user. And as you go through and map out the admin portion, um, sometimes you'll find, and it sounds, it sounds kind of simple sometimes, but you'll find that some of the admin screens a lower privileged user can get to um, just by knowing the, the URL and just going to it, right? So forced browsing. Um, so if you have an admin user, you can map out all the admin functions under that user as this tool is, uh, is sending the same exact request, just basically replacing the cookies um, with the ones used for the lower privileged. And you can very easily then spot where you have some horizontal and vertical escalations. So here's, here's what it looks like. By default, it's just turned off. And you feed it cookies. So what I like to do is use two browsers. I'll take one browser and log in as a low privileged user and I'll take the other and log in as an admin or just another user. And point them both through burp and you can use the button down here to grab the cookies. So you feed it the cookies of the user that you want it to make the request of, right? And then you just go and browse then in the, using the browser of the admin or the other user. Um, and so you can see the, the button's red. Once you're ready, once you have it all set up, you just click the button, turns it on, and then you start browsing. And here's what you get is a side-by-side -side comparison of every request that you've made after you've turned it on. And you can see session, the, the original length, so the browser you're using to, to actually map out and you know, as admin or the other user. Here's the length that it came back as. Here's the modified, so the, the user that that's lower privileged, um, you know, that's what it came back as, and this is as an anonymous user, uh, that column there, uh, so that's the length that they get. So it just does a, a comparison, and you can see here where it starts to, to highlight, it's, it says, uh, I don't know if you can read it, but it says authoriz authorization bypass. So you can see this first one here, the original session had a, a length of 690. The second one had a, a session of 679. And the anonymous had 8, 828. So it's got, it's got a little bit of variable. Um, so that one may or may not be a false, false positive, but if you start to look down here at the bottom, those start to line up. And actually in this engagement uh, that I took this from was against a, a medical records application. And I was using this and found uh, where, where they go and generate reports. And so the requests that I'm making here that I blacked out, sorry, you can't see them. Uh, the requests are hitting this, this reporting engine and it spits out a PDF. And what I found using this pretty, pretty quickly was uh, a whole, whole bunch of medical records that you know, the, the first user should see. They're an admin and they, they can see, they can get to everywhere. The, the second user, absolutely should not have been able to see that. I'm talking you know, 50,000 plus, this is a staging environment and they had 50,000 records or so. Um, the second user shouldn't have been able to see any of that except their own. It can see all of them. Uh, what was really interesting though is you notice down there anonymously, if I know the URL and I can, I, I can find that, you know, how it's spitting out reports, they were all just named by a six digit number. 
So anonymously, I can find that, and oh, hey, now I can just start iterating through, and I just found all the medical records in this application anonymously. So pros just mentioned it's, it's really nice to quickly test large portions of the application for those types of, uh, of authorization issues. Really easy to spot the differences from that screenshot you saw. It'll, it'll you know, highlight it for you and authorization bypass. So it's really easy to spot. Uh, it's really nice to be able to do the anonymous testing at the same time. Um, I did not, in that application, even remotely expect that, that the anonymous would work. Obviously, that's something as a tester you always want to test anyway. Um, but it gives you the opportunity then to test not only for the escalations, but the anonymous portion as well. Uh, so you're kind of, kind of, you know, doing two birds with one stone at that point. And then the cons, I, you know, I pointed out that one, it was within its margin uh, of error or, or the difference that it was looking for in the request. So the first one wasn't, wasn't a, a true detection. It was just close enough that it detected and said, hey, authorization bypass. Actually wasn't. So you, you do have some false positives. Um, that you want to go through and, and make sure that you verify that, that, it is, um, that it is a real detection. So another specific task, session timeout test. So this plugin will allow you to just do exactly what it's, what it's telling you is test for session timeout. Um, some applications, you know, fall under PCI. It has specific rules for when sessions timeout and things like that. Uh, so in some cases, knowing, you know, down to the minute when it's timing out and, and things for, you know, compliance reasons is, is important. So what you can do is you basically just feed it a string to look for that says, hey, your session timed out. You know, however the application lets you know your session timed out, some will say your session timed out, some will redirect you to the login screen, you know, um, things like that. So what I typically do with this is, as I'm testing, I'll leave a session open uh, over lunch or something, come back and see how it responded to being locked out or timed out. And then later on, you know, later that day or maybe when I'm at lunch the next day, I'll use this plugin. So here's a look at it. So top one there, string to match. So in this case, really simple example, your session's timed out. I want it to report when it finds that. And then the, the next two are you know, I don't, I don't want it to obviously send a request every minute and then increment it two minutes, things like that. Uh, it'll take forever. So your setting here, I want it to start at 15 minutes. It'll send, it'll send a request and see if it's timed out. And down there, the interval then is, do you want it to check every minute at that point? Do you want it to, so gets to 15 minutes, it sends a, re a request, waits, 16 minutes and it'll send a request. Wait 17 minutes and send a request and see if it's timed out uh, that way. So uh, down below then uh, is your testing results. I, I, I didn't have, I didn't grab a screenshot when I was using this uh, in, a, in a real session. So it's uh, just a really quick test. Uh, it tells you down there, test complete, no, no timeout detected. Uh, obviously if it's in a real scenario, you know, it times out, it'll tell you, hey, it timed out, here's the, Here's the time length at, at when it timed out. So pros, it's easy to test when you're, when you're doing something else, doing lunch, you know, things like that. You're still getting something done there and testing. Cons, don't forget to click start before you walk away. I've done that on more than one occasion. And it's frustrating. All right, so the next one is called Paramalyzer. And this is, this is an interesting one because it'll basically look across all the parameters that are in scope. So, you know, you go to you, your uh, targeting application, you put it in scope, it'll analyze all those parameters for you and give you a really nice little overview of, of all the parameters it found and an example value of here's, here's what was in it. And it will even do a little bit of analysis for you and say, hey, this looks like it was a base 64 encoded value, or this is just an ASCII string, or this is a hex value, you know, that's things like that. And I like to use it um, not, not just for the analysis portion of it. I like to use it as a list of, okay, here's my parameters that I make sure I went and, and manually tested each one of these, that I fuzz every single one of these. So there's a look at it. So in this case, you can see up here where 
you know, view state, things like that, you don't want it to analyze. So this is, that's, those are set by default. So if you're using, you know, looking at a, an ASP.NET application, you know, you're gonna have a ton of view state. Uh, it doesn't analyze things like that. And you can add to that as well. But then the, the middle section here, you can see where it's giving me a list of all the different parameters that it's found, how many requests it saw that parameter, um, unique URL, things like that. And then as you keep walking across the different columns there, um, format. So, you know, first one, it only saw it in a numeric format, just, just integers. Next one, you know, 69% of the time it was a word, things like that. Uh, it also tells you, was it reflected? Um, was it decodable? So it'll try, it's, hey, I saw this as basics for encoded. Was, was I able to decode it? Sure. Um, things like that. And then the final over here is, here's an example value of one of the ones I saw. So if you want to really dial in on one of these, so the one I have highlighted here is just D units. Um, you can see that's what the example is down below. And it's showing you values and you can look and see all the different unique values for it as well. So not just the example one that it has up top, here's all the unique values that it found as well. So you can, if you're, you know, you find something interesting with this, this particular parameter, you can go through and look at all the unique values that this, that the tool uh, pulled out for you. And then over here, you got the, your, you know, your familiar request and response tabs to, to look at. Uh, and the button in the middle there is kind of nice. You can highlight the value then and go find it in, uh, in your proxy history as well. All right, so we just covered a lot of plugins in, in the store um, that are you know, free and available to use. At this point, does anybody have any questions? I do. Um, I really considered putting in this. I just, at this point, I had so many plugins and I wasn't really sure I'd be doing it for time. So, okay. uh, yeah, I, I do. CO2 is, a, is another great one. Um, I could, uh, you know, I could talk up here for another hour on plugins I, I like to use. So, so many things. yeah, it's so versatile. Yeah, yep. So, the plugin she mentioned is CO2 and it, yeah, it, it does so many different things. I, I can't even go through all of them on top of my head here, but go ahead. Some of them do. Uh, some of them you need the professional edition. When you go into the store, it'll tell you whether or not it requires so professional. Some, like features that plugins are relying on that you need the paid edition, or is it that the plugins are paid? You know, I'm not sure. The, none of the plugins uh, that I know of in the store are paid. Um, so I don't, I don't know where the distinction is of, hey, this one can be used in the free and this one can be used in professional. But. Yeah, and that would make that would make sense. Yeah, so if you're are you talking specifically about the Volners plugin? Traditional volt scanner is going to be way better. This is just, uh, hey, I saw this come across and I happen to know the, there's CVs for it. So in your opinion, since I haven't deployed this plugin before, would you recommend using that traditional volt scanner for the web user and your application, or should I be using that plugin over the web scanner? Um, I guess it depends on your goals. If, if you have the opportunity to use uh, the traditional volt scanner, you'll get better results with it, for sure. So yeah, if, if you have the opportunity, I would still, I would still go that route. Nick? Yeah, um, so you mentioned these uh, plugins are published on GitHub, that we should check them out there. I, I don't think this will be a problem in the, uh, the first store, but have you ever seen a malicious first plugin? Personally, no, I haven't. I, I do, you know, I have seen, there's plugins that are made available outside of the store. Um, so, I mean, just like anything else, I'd say, you know, use caution. Just like you know, loading an unknown Metasploit module or anything like that, you know. I hope you trust the the person that's providing it. But no, I haven't seen an actual malicious one myself personally. Have you? No, no. Just curious. <laughs> uh, any other questions? 
All right, so we got about 15 minutes left. I just want to move into uh, writing your own plugins uh, because every now and then, you know, the need arises where having your own customized plugin, having the flexibility of being able to write your own is absolutely, you know, just awesome and, and a huge time saver. So if you didn't know, Burp exposes an API. It's got some documentation that we'll look at in a little bit. Um, it supports Java, so Burp itself is written in Java. You can do plugins in Java, because uh, that's native to it. Um, you can do Python using Jython, which is just an interpreter that takes your Python code and um, translates it into Java bytecode. Or you can use JRuby, which is similar. Uh, the example I want to walk through, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a Java developer by any means. I can kind of fiddle my way through it. Uh, I use Python quite a bit, though. Uh, so our example is going to use Python. So here's a really quick look at setting up the environment for that. Uh, up top here is if you're writing in Java, you can point it at a location of um, different uh, jar files that you need loaded with it. Uh, and really similar, Python will do the same, uh, where that second optional uh, optional uh, input here is, here's modules that may or may not be available to burp as we're running. So you can include them into a directory and say, hey, as you're running my plugin, here's the other modules you'll need. But the really important thing is that first part there, you need to have installed uh, Jython for this to work, obviously. And this is just telling it, hey, here's, here's where that Jython interpreter is. So that's, that's, uh, that's what my, uh, the, the value is there, is the interpreter installed on my laptop here. Did you have it in Burr before? When did you do the Maryland? Like how many extensions actually go required to install this? Because usually if you're not running your own, there are some extensions that still require that you have Python. Yep, that's a, that's a great point. Some of the ones in the store are also written in Python or Ruby, and you have to, to get those to work properly, you would also have to set those. So I mentioned some of the documentation. Here's just a quick look. Uh, when you're in the extender tab, you have APIs here. And it's, it's got some documentation that you can look through then as you're developing. Uh, if you need a reference, um, you know, it's just right there in the API or in the documentations here. So the examples that I'm going to walk through in, in just a little bit, it's using PyCharm Community Edition if anybody's interested in what what those are, and you can see an example down here when you can't really see the interface or anything, but um, that's what the screenshots are using. And then the example plugin that I'm going to talk about is uh, it's going to be, it's going to have a GUI tab and it's a token generator. So this one in particular was for a target where I, we were testing an API and you had to have a specific token in the header and it was time based. Uh, so it'd be good for 15 minutes and then you have to regenerate and plug all those in. Well, that really sucks when you got a really long running, you know, intruder session or something like that. Uh, it may, may possibly go over 15 minutes or even scanner too. Um, that may go over that time limit and all of a sudden it stops working. So what we wanted to do was take, take the plugin and take the request and just auto generate these for us and just plug them in. So that's what this is. Uh, and I, I included some of the, the code here so you can kind of see what it is. The main thing being it's looking for a public key, a pipe, a timestamp, a pipe, and then a hash value. So that's, that's basically what we're going to write here. So up top for the imports, so I mentioned this is a Python specific IDE that I was using. So you can see up here, you know, all the squiggly lines, it's complaining saying, I have no idea what that is, that's an unresolved reference. Um, that's just because Obviously, it doesn't know about the modules in Burp and things like that. Some of the Python, the, the standard Python libraries, you can see, hey, it's going to import it just fine. It doesn't care. Some of the Java and Burp stuff, though, it doesn't know about, so it's complaining, saying, hey, I have no, no idea about these. That's OK, because once, once it's running within the, the Burp environment, those things are available to it. Uh, just the IDE itself just doesn't know. So we have to start out with extending the, uh, or creating the burp extender class. And so this is all, I mean, fairly easy to walk through. So we're creating a class. Um, 
we're giving it the different things. So iverb extender is required. Um, some of the others are optional. So we're creating a GUI for this. So iTab is that GUI tab that we're going to create and things like that. I, the HTTP listener is, uh, gives us access then to the requests and things through Burp. And then you can see we're registering callbacks. Callbacks is something that Burp makes available for really common um, functions that you're going to want to do um, that makes you know really easy for you then. And we'll get a we'll get a look at some of those in just a bit. Um, well, actually, there's an example here at the bottom. Set extension name uh, is one of the callbacks. So I just gave it a generic name of API token gen. So this part is building the GUI. Now I mentioned that you know I don't do a ton with Java, and I certainly don't build GUIs. Um, so this part was a, a little bit clunky to me at first, um, but basically what we're doing is we're setting up different panels. Um, and once we get to the GUI portion, you'll see we're setting up panels. We're, we're defining all those things. Uh, I need to feed it a public key and a private key so you can see I'm creating labels and text boxes for those, uh, adding in different rows that they're going to live and, and things like that. So that's what this, all of this is here. So we're going to put in a save button. I don't want to put those in every time I'm running. You know, if I shut down Burp and I come back the next day, I don't want to have to put those back in every time. Uh, so create a button. It's going to save the, the values that we enter. And then all the, all the panels and things that we've defined, um, and this is just bringing all of it back together now. So we're actually building some of the rows, defining those, setting up dimensions, everything like that. And then in the end, it all fits under you know, a different panel. So you can see the J main panel there. Uh, so we're defining panels and things that all of these different GUI aspects uh, live under once we have the UI set up. So this is just a little bit of extra um, components of the, of the tab. So we're looking specifically at the GUI tab that we're going to create now that's going to be in Burp. So uh, caption, token generator, um, GUI component, and uh, we're looking at the main panel. So once we click on that tab, that's what we want to see is that main panel. So this one, this is the part that's actually doing the work that, of finding where we want to put our token into our response, or our request, I'm sorry. It's going to find where we want it. So it, I mentioned it's an API, so it's all XML based. Um, there was a node in the XML where we want to feed that. So what this is doing then is, is taking, it's saying, process HTTP message. So we can tell it if we want to. Um, one of the required things here is tool flag. So we can use that and say, you know, I only want this to work on the intruder portion or scanner or whatever. In this case, it's going across all of those. We didn't actually use it. Uh, the next part is messages request. So we, we want to act on the requests. We don't obviously need to inject anything to the response. That doesn't make any sense. So we're looking at message is request. Um, and then that last one there is passing in the actual message information. And then the first if there is, is that logic then of, if it's not a request, just pass on. We don't need to process it any further in our plugin. So the block down there then is, we have that request available to us and we want to pick apart interesting things then like, uh, um, the first line there is getting the request. The second line is, is looking at um, bytes, and then you can see it's getting the body offset. So we specifically want to process the, the body portion, so we're getting the offset so we can use that later. And then when you, once you see tree, uh, that's, that's a, a Python library then that's going to actually process the XML for us. And what we specifically want it to find is where it's this keynote here. So we're setting, we're finding the key.text, and then we're going to use a function here in just a second to generate the token. And so what we're telling it is, this is, you know, once we generate the token, here's where we're going to plug it in essentially. And then once we do that, create a new body. So we plug it in, we're creating then a new body that we're going to replace that original request with, with this new one with our token in it. So 
we'd, we'd already defined the button and everything before all of that. This is actually the, the logic behind that. So basically the button was there to say, once I, I plug in my public and private keys and click save, it's going to save it. Uh, that way I don't have to re-put uh, them in every single time. So this is uh, the end of the, the script here then. And you already saw it. This is what's actually generating the token. So it's that public key pipe timestamp thing that we already looked at. This is the actual logic to compute that using a fresh timestamp. And uh, so we have an actual um, valid value then uh, based on the public or the private key so that we're essentially authenticated then once we have this because we've shown that, hey, we have access to the private key. So down there, it's just returning that token uh, into that into the uh, function before uh, what was finding that portion in the XML, plugging that in, creates our new body, and that's what Burp then sends on to the application. So then each request, we don't have to generate that. It just automatically does it. So the results then, here's the GUI, all the different portions. So we talked about the different rows and the main panel and all that. All of that was to basically get two input boxes and a button here. Uh, but essentially, it's, I plug in that public key, private key, save it, and now I can do all my testing. All of that's just done automatically for me. Then I don't have to worry about generating tokens um, as we go. So that's the, that's the DIY portion. Does uh, anybody have any additional questions around that? All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, we've got one. Yeah, so that's a great point. It, you can't debug it because the, the IDE doesn't know about those things. It'll just crash right away and say, hey, I, I can't import this. So the way you end up debugging that is by importing it into Burp and looking at errors. It's, it's painful. It is painful. I don't know of a better way to do it at this point. Um, Java, I'm, I'm sure it probably would be. Honestly, I just don't have enough experience with it to, to give you a good answer there. But yeah, Python, it's a little bit of a pain. It's, it's kind of painful to, yeah, yeah, it is. That's a great question, though, and a great point. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, everybody. really appreciate it.